so this add-on is a discussion we had, which covers a leftover topic, somewhat tangential, but not really, of the debate between Einstein and Niels Bohr. This was a watershed moment in the history of science that took place around the time of the two world wars in the last century. But in order to understand its true significance, we have to get technical here. This is why the discussion begins with me getting Yasser to explain a few physics concepts that are especially important for this conversation. Those concepts are realism, locality, and determinism. And I asked Yasser to explain all of these one by one first so that afterwards he can explain what actually happened with the history of science and quantum mechanics here. Okay, so let's start with Yasser explaining first what realism is. So realism in physics is the belief that objects have properties, whether or not one measures those properties. So let's say if you have a tennis ball, you would say that the tennis ball has a position, whether or not you measure its position. That the tennis ball has some velocity, whether or not you measure the speed of the tennis ball. It has some energy, whether anybody measures it or not. So the tennis ball has an objective reality outside of my reality. So whether or not I exist, the tennis ball will exist. Absolutely. It is independent of your knowledge or ignorance of the tennis ball's properties. Okay. And what about locality? Locality is an idea that becomes relevant when we talk about cause and effect in science. So locality means that the cause cannot communicate with the effect at a rate faster than the speed of light. As an example, imagine that you had a superpower, you could zap the sun out of existence instantaneously, this very instant. Just press a button and the sun is gone. Absolutely. There's no light coming from the sun. It has no gravitational pull on the earth. The sun is just gone instantaneously. This is the cause in the sequence of cause and effect. What will be the effect on the earth? The effect on the earth is going to be there's no light coming from the sun, there's darkness, and the gravitational effect is going to be that the earth will no longer follow its uh, elliptical orbit. It will go off in a straight line tangent to the curve. So what locality enforces here is that the effects cannot take place until the cause can be communicated And that can only happen at the speed of light. And since it takes light eight and a half minutes to travel from the sun to the earth, it will not be until eight and a half minutes after the sun has been zapped that you will actually see the lights go out and the earth go tangential uh, to its original elliptical path. So if I turn off the sun or you turn off the sun or just erase its existence, Mm -hmm. I will continue to see the sun... For another eight and a half minutes because... Because the photons that the sun emitted eight and a half minutes ago are still in transit in the space between the earth and the sun. And even though the sun is no longer there, those photons are traveling through space. And only after you have received those photons, you will realize that the sun has disappeared. So in a sense, classical physics quantifies our intuition about realism and locality. First, define classical physics. So classical physics is the physics whose foundation was laid by Newton. Uh, So it's Newton's laws of motion and unbalanced force results in acceleration. And uh, so... So stuff we learn in high school, basically. Yeah. And and like I said, it aligns with our intuition. And uh, that would say that the moon exists whether or not you measure its position. That uh, a tree that falls in a forest where there is nobody present would still make a sound. So this is objective reality. Unless you're a Buddhist, then it probably doesn't make a sound. (laughs) So coming back to (laughs) physics. um, Now moving on to locality. Newton also gave us the universal law of gravitation, which relates how two masses exert gravitational attractive forces on each other. According to this law, the force is instantaneous. It depends, its magnitude depends on the distance or the separation of the two objects. 
which means that if one of the objects were zapped, like the sun in our previous example, the second object will... Instantaneously? Or? Yeah, it would instantaneously uh, stop reacting to the force, right? So the force disappears instantaneously. So this violates locality. And Newton was aware of this problem. He was not happy with it that this force should be communicated over a distance so the two masses could be on opposite ends of the universe. And yet the effect of one mass disappearing would be felt by the other mass instantaneously. And Newton was deeply disturbed by this. What was that term they used? Um, there was a specific term they used spooky to describe action. spooky action at a distance, right? This was used by New, uh, by Einstein much later and in a different context. So, oh, okay. okay, okay. Yeah. But uh, this action at a distance force was problematic but because Newton's law of gravitation was so successful it was able to analytically come up with the orbits of the known planets and of comets and within the lifetime of Newton he saw so many successes that people quickly put aside their problems with the action at a distance and they were just happy with the predictive power of this law. Now uh, move forward let's say 150 years into the 19th century and uh, as we start to develop uh, and model electricity and magnetism similar problems of action at a distance arise with those interactions as well so you have coulomb's law which is the analog of two charges interacting with each other just like two planets. Just like two planets or two stars interacting with the gravitational pull. So the Coulomb's, Coulomb's law was also an instantaneous action at a distance force. And two magnets were thought to interact in a similar manner. Uh, however, as the theory developed over the course of the 19th century, uh, Maxwell was able to encapsulate all of these laws together into what is now known as Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism, this set of four differential mathematical equations. And uh, what these equations did was they were able to provide an intermediary for this action at a distance force. In fact, they said that each charge creates an electric field around it and changes in the electric field are only communicated at the speed of light. And so another charge which is placed inside that field will only uh, experiences changes that are communicated at most at this speed. And why at the speed of light? Uh, so the speed of light uh, at this point just fell out of the equations that Maxwell, this was completely coincidental uh, as far as Maxwell was concerned. And in fact, when he saw that the speed that fell out of his equations corresponded so closely to the measured speed of light, he predicted based on that that uh, light was itself an electromagnetic wave and that was of course confirmed in some 10 years after and this prediction. Is, this is before the concept of a photon, right? At this point light is a wave? Absolutely, yes. So in fact Maxwell's equations were the pivotal argument in favor of waves. After that point everybody was convinced that light is in fact a wave. Newton had spent his life arguing that light was particle-like, corpuscular, as he liked to call it. Uh, but with Maxwell, we see the transition completed back towards the fact that light is a wave. So let me get this straight. Um, if you make any changes in the field, uh, the maximum limit that you can cap is the speed of light. The max... The Well, at this point, Maxwell's equations are only talking about changes in the electric field. Yes. yes, which are produced maybe by moving charges and magnets around. Um, and yes, so he says that these changes will travel through the field at a rate which is equal to the speed of light. So there is no idea, there is no uh, speed limit, so to speak. It's just the speed at which the changes are communicated. Okay. And we have to fast. We have to fast. And this forward. is only this is only relevant to electromagnetism at this point. Right? Absolutely, but it. It wasn't lost on uh, the scientific community that uh, we've now bridged 
uh, we have we started with a problem where there was action at a distance and we've bridged that action at a distance by introducing fields and disturbances that travel at a fixed rate through those fields. So Einstein in 1905 takes this model and he introduces the field model, the field model of gravity overcoming the shortcomings of uh, oh, new- so wait a second so the field model was developed by faraday that right? is yes specifically in the context of electromagnetism at this point that is correct so for faraday this was a visual uh, geometric model for how a charge influences its surroundings right he was not very good mathematician so he wasn't able to uh, write mathematical equations for it, but in order to visualize it, he said that each charge creates these uh, fields around it, and he tended to think of them in terms of uh, kind of like elastic bands of force. Now, Einstein in 1905, he takes the field model for electromagnetism and he develops a field model for gravitation. He models it on the field model for electromagnetism. And uh, he develops a field model for gravitation and solves the action at a distance problem that had been introduced by Newton with his universal law for gravitation. And that's Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. So he's the one who basically introduced the light as a speed limit concept, right? That is correct, yes. Uh, that, so the theory of relativity has uh, two postulates. And one of them is that the speed of light is constant in every inertial frame. Now, this doesn't mm, that set... That sounds complicated. That does sound complicated. <laughs> it doesn't state that the speed of light is the speed limit, but if you want physics to be consistent, it turns out that any massive object, by massive I mean having a mass not equal to zero, any massive particle which is moving at a speed less than the speed of light can never be accelerated to the speed of light. So this, in order for physics to be consistent, this follows directly from the postulate of uh, relativity that the speed of light is the same measured in any inertial frame. Yes. So the, that means that what we saw in Star Wars, where they travel at the speed of light, it's fake? <laughs> oh no, Star Wars is fake? No way. <laughs> Seriously? Is there a Santa Claus though, right? There oh no, Santa? so let, let's actually, let's, uh, uh, if we are going to talk about that, matter, which is mass having a non-zero mass, cannot be teleported from one place to another at the speed of light. However, information can be. So if you think about the information that goes into constituting a human being, that information can be teleported at the speed of light and a human can be reconstructed at that site. So that matter itself is not uh, teleported, but matter that's already present at the new location could be reconstituted by teleporting information at the speed of light. Does that make sense? Yeah. Getting back to the frame of reference, though, that Einstein was talking about. So this relates to the fact that you can have light as a cosmic speed limit within a local area of the universe, but two separate parts of the universe can still move away from each other at faster than the speed of light, right? So that's what the idea is of the expansion of the universe, the universe expanding faster than the speed of light kind of situation. Right. Uh, so this puts a limit on how fast information or matter can be transported. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're talking about the universe expanding, what is it that is expanding? Nothing. Right. Yeah, it is uh, a vacuum that is expanding. And so this does not contradict the speed limit of light. Right. So getting back to locality, mm -hmm. right? how does this relate to locality in physics? So the way this ties into locality is that it actually puts a strict limit on how fast causes can communicate with effects. So this is now saying that any cause cannot be communicated at a speed greater than the speed of light to make an effect. So in the beginning, that was not a rule that physics had to follow. That right? is correct. Although physicists like Newton did think that uh, this is part of their observation. And when he formulated the universal law of gravitation, 
which allowed instantaneous action at a distance, he was uncomfortable with it. So physicists intuitively understood that causes must precede effects, right. and they were uncomfortable with introducing models that did not obey that. They just But, didn't know that the speed of light is that cosmic limit. That is correct, yes. Okay, so then you've got Maxwell and Faraday, they bring in the concept of fields, and then Einstein uses those fields to impose a cosmic speed limit on everything, all of physics, every physical interaction as a speed of light, basically. That is correct, yes. So at this point in 1905, um, we have a understanding of classical mechanics together with relativity, uh, where the universe is both real and it obeys locality. Moreover, the classical world is deterministic. So let me say what determinism means. Determinism means that if we know the state of the universe at one point in time, classically, it means we know the positions and velocities of every single particle that there exists in the universe. So if you know the position and velocity of all the particles in the universe at one instant in time, then a deterministic universe means that we will be able to predict the state of the universe at every future instant in time. And so the classical description of the world is a deterministic description. Now, this is the point in time where the quantum revolution completely upends our notions of reality and locality and uh, makes us really consider those ideas carefully. So let me introduce uh, quantum mechanics at this point. So during the first half of the uh, 20th century, quantum mechanics uh, is developed as an alternative to classical mechanics and it also proposes to explain how the state of a system evolves over time. Where it differs radically from classical mechanics is how it defines the state of the system. The state of a system is no longer uh, the position and momenta of the individual particles within the system. Rather, the state of the system is described by what is called the wave function of the system. So in simple terms, a wave function is a function of position. Let's take divide space into two regions, left and right. If the wave function is peaked, has a high value in the left region, it implies that there is a high probability of finding the particle on the left side. If the wave function is peaked on the right side, then we would say there's a high probability of finding the particle on the right side. So where this gets interesting is quantum mechanics is a linear theory. What that means is that if the particle being on the left is a possibility and the particle being on the right is a possibility, then the superposition of these two possibilities, the sum of the two wave functions which are peaked on the left side and the right side, is also a valid state of the system. So the super, so define the superposition concept a little bit. Yeah, so superposition is a mathematical term here. It means the sum of the wave functions. So remember how I say if the particle has a high probability of being on the left side, then the wave function will have a high value on the left side. And if the particle has a high probability of being on the right side, then the wave function is highly peaked on the right side. Now, if you take those two functions and add them together, the resultant function will have will be a bimodal function. It'll have two peaks, one on the left side and one on the right side. What does that mean? That means the particle has a high probability of being found both on the left side and on the right side. At the same time. At the same time, indeed. And so, that's reality. That particle is in a superposition of both of those positions. Well, that gets to the heart of the problem. Now we have to grapple with, is the wave function... Describing it, reality. Rea is it describing reality? Or is the wave function just a statement about our knowledge of the system? So that goes to the heart of the problem. Let me discuss another example of this. So consider an atom, a radioactive atom in particular. So the atom may be whole or it may have radioactively decayed. There will be a description of the state of the whole atom in terms of a wave function and a description 
of the decayed atom in terms of a wave function. And because those are both valid descriptions of the state of an atom, we can superimpose those two states to create a superimposed system. Uh, like, yeah, or... superimposed uh, atom which is decayed and not decayed at the same time. If that sounds strange to your classically trained mind, then just wait. <laughs> it gets weirder still. So as Schrodinger, who was one of the uh, founders of quantum mechanics, he showed that this weirdness, quantum weirdness, is not limited to the microscopic realm. In fact, through the process of quantum entanglement, you can easily spill these uh, strange effects into the macroscopic realm. And the example that uh, Schrodinger used was the famous example of Schrodinger's cat. So let me set up that problem. Imagine you have this radioactive atom, which is possibly whole or decayed, and it's placed in a enclosed container where there is a cat present. We rig this atom in uh, such a way that uh, there is a detector which will, upon detecting a radioactive decay, break a vial of poison and <laughs> kill the cat. That's yeah, really dark. <laughs> it's <Enough>. dark. <laughs> it is indeed. And um, so while the atom is whole, the cat is alive. When the atom has decayed, the cat is dead. But when the atom is in a superposition of the whole and decayed state, then it must mean that the cat is in a superposition state of being alive and dead. Alive see, slash dead. And this is quantum entanglement, where you have these two bodies whose states are mixed together in this fashion. So what everybody agrees on here is when you open the box and observe the atom and cat, you're either going to find that the atom is whole and the cat is alive, or that the atom has decayed and the cat is dead. So it's either or. You're not going to find them in a superposition state. This is where interpretations of quantum mechanics creep in. What happened between opening the box and the superposition state? So the Copenhagen interpretation, which is perhaps the mainstream orthodox interpretation of quantum mechanics, it advocates a collapse of the wave function. So what it says is that uh, when the box is open, the superposition state of the wave function collapses and it localizes to either the whole atom and a live cat or it localizes to the decayed atom and dead cat. And this collapse happens instantaneously. So Bohr, Niels Bohr, was the founder of the Copenhagen interpretation. Right. right. So, yeah, he was the champion for that interpretation. And, ac and according to Bohr, before you open the box, the cat was actually in a superposition of states. That's what Schrodinger was saying. That's the... Uh, that's Yes. Yeah. So according to Bohr, in fact, the superposition state, the cat and the atom didn't have definite properties. They were not definitely dead or alive. They were not whole or decayed. They didn't have those properties. Those properties come into existence upon observation. So they did not really have an objective reality. Basically. That is correct. And you see here that uh, reality comes into question. Whether properties like uh, an atom is whole or decayed is coming into question. Whether an atom, whether it's meaningful to ask that question before the measurement is made. So what did Einstein think about this? So Einstein and Schrodinger both were extremely uncomfortable with this abandonment of reality. And they insisted that the quantum mechanical description of the system reflected our ignorance on our part. In fact, the cat and the atom had definite properties before our observation. We were just ignorant of those properties. And uh, so they were basically saying that 
quantum mechanics as a theory is incomplete. Yes, not that it is incorrect, but that it is incomplete. That it did not describe objective reality. It was consistent with that reality, but that uh, the probability in quantum mechanics was a result of the incompleteness of quantum description of reality. Now, Einstein worked diligently over the next few decades to try to poke holes into the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics to show that this was in fact incomplete, that particles had definite properties irrespective of whether we measured them or not. And in doing so, he crystallized his thinking in this paper he wrote jointly with two other authors in 1935, uh, famously known as the EPR paper. Um, the EPR paradox. Though. Yes, the EPR paradox indeed. And uh, so I can't describe the whole paper because it's really, um, really technical. What I can do is give you a gist of it. And a Cliff's Notes version. A Cliff Notes version, exactly. So what Einstein essentially said is you can create a pair of entangled particles. So remember, entangled particles are like that atom and cat whose properties are somehow dependent on each other. So Sounds, I, sounds very romantic, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Which is why you will find a number of these... Uh, Deepak Chopra. Deepak one, Chopra's yeah. exploiting it to no end. So Einstein, however, had a very definite argument he was trying to home in on. And he said, you create this pair of entangled particles and then you send them very, very far apart. And he said, if you measure the properties of one of these particles, then you would know definitely the properties of the other particle. And by this, he argued that the particle that we did not measure has objective reality, has properties in absence of measurement. So he thought that this was an argument that destroys Bohr's argument that properties are only created when measurement takes place and that no reality exists. The properties do not exist before measurement. Bohr countered this and Bohr said that in fact, when you measure the properties of the first particle, it instantaneously creates the properties of the second particle. That in fact, the second particle did not have those definite properties before measurement of the first particle. You will notice now that since the two particles are far away, in order for it to instantaneously communicate, you have to violate locality. And so... The speed of light limit. That is correct. The speed of light limit. Because this is instantaneous. Right? This is instantaneous. A fine point here is that this instantaneous communication does not violate relativity because no classical communication is taking place between these two particles. What I mean by that is if you measure the properties of the first particle, you know the properties of the second particle. But somebody who's sitting next to the second particle cannot know those properties until they are communicated by the measurer over a classical channel. So those properties can only be communicated to somebody next to the second particle at the speed of light. So Classic while this possible. violates locality, it does not violate information being communicated between those two particles. Now, both Einstein and Bohr stuck to their own arguments. So it was like a stalemate. Up at the, it was a stalemate. Uh, there was, it was felt that there was no empirical way to decide between their two interpretations. And it was uh, set aside as a metaphysical question. Well, that's up until John Bell comes to the scene, uh, which is around, uh, let's say... 50s? 50s, 60s? Yeah, 60s. so about a few decades later. And uh, somebody described John Bell as an experimental metaphysicist. So John Bell devised an inequality which quantum mechanics violates. And according to John Bell, this forces us to choose between a universe which is real or a universe that obeys locality. But we cannot have a universe that obeys both locality and realism. So you have to give up on either reality 
or locality. So this reminds me of a game my son likes to play with me. It's called Would You Rather. So this this is kind of like a game of Would You Rather. Would you rather give up on reality? Would you rather believe that the moon doesn't exist when you're not looking at it? Or would you rather give up on locality? And with the consequence that cause and effect lose meaning. Cause doesn't have to precede effect. It could be the other way around. It is a choice that Einstein didn't want to choose, certainly. He wanted to have a theory which preserves both reality and locality. So going back to the the sun example, Mm -hmm. uh, locality... If you take locality out of the picture, then what happens? So if you take locality out of the picture, then extinguishing the sun could instantaneously send the earth out of orbit. Or the earth could go out of orbit before the sun gets extinguished. Because there's no causal link between the two. Kind that of, is right? correct. Yeah. Causes don't have to precede effects. And on the other hand, the sun and the earth won't even really exist. Right, because without realism, these terms are meaningless. There's no objective yeah. reality to either of them. That is correct, until a measurement is made. Man, yes. that is a really tough choice to make. <laughs> yeah, that is that is a... I mean, it's, it's not a choice that you would want to make, you know. But between the two, I would say realism is the clear and obvious important winner, right? Like, you can't have... Yeah, I feel like uh, certainly I would feel a non-scientist would definitely easily give up on locality and keep reality because, yeah, if if you give up on reality, like, I feel... Philosophers would definitely choose realism I, over yeah. locality. In fact, even Einstein preferred realism over locality. Locality, yeah. If he had to choose... Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, he didn't he didn't want to give up on either. No one rationally minded would want to give up on either. Yeah. But uh, if quantum mechanics is correct and uh, the scientific consensus is that it is correct, then we have to give up on one, at least one of them. You could give up on both if you like. <laughs> I think okay. Cop- does Copenhagen did Niels Bohr give up on both? I don't think he cared about either. Yeah, really. he didn't care about either because that's an interpretational issue. He just cared about making predictions which were confirmed by experiment, and you don't have to worry about whether it's real or obeys locality as long as it. And do you want to mention the the conference they had? The Earlier Solvay on, conference. yes, the Solvay conference before the EPR paradox, right? Because that was the turning point, I think, when Einstein and Bohr went head to head. And the result was Einstein kind of lost that debate. And then all the neutrals kind of went into Bohr's camp, right? Yeah, so the Solvay conference was this conference in the 1920s, a series of conferences which were organized by a Belgian billionaire um, who had made his money by making uh, sodium carbonate. Anyway, so (laughs) he invited uh, all the top physicists, some 20 or top physicists of the time. uh, By the way, isn't it amazing how there were so many geniuses alive at the same time? Absolutely. Like, that's probably the first time in human history that so many geniuses are alive at the same time. And at a time of such uh, political upheaval. upheaval. Yeah, Yeah, it's it's just remarkable. Right between the two world wars. Yeah. So, uh, the Solvay Conference aimed at bringing together these 20-odd leading physicists to discuss the frontiers of science, the questions at the frontier of science. And one of the questions that was discussed here was the interpretations of quantum mechanics, what it really means, whether it describes reality or not. And Einstein had hoped that by going to this conference, he might be able to convince some of the people towards his point of view. But as it turned out, Bohr came out the winner in those debates and the scientific community ended up siding with Bohr and giving up on reality and mass. And we're basically 
paying for the consequences, all of us, since then. Since then, point. indeed. And uh, uh, as a consequence of that, today, almost, I would say, 99% of the physicists who are working in this area are working with a version of quantum mechanics that gives up on realism. Whereas giving up on locality is a equally valid choice, but there are countably few theories which take up that challenge. In fact, there is an interpretation of quantum mechanics which preserves realism and lets locality go, right? That is correct. So this is a one of the early interpretations of quantum mechanics proposed by Louis de Broglie, who was one of the founders of quantum mechanics as well. And this uh, interpretation matured with the contributions of David Bohm much later du- during the 1950s. And this interpretation actually preserves reality. So it says that particles have properties such as position and velocities, irrespective of whether we measure their properties or not. And the probabilities which enter into quantum mechanics according to this interpretation are a consequence of our imprecision in measuring those properties. And uh, so these are just statistical uh, uncertainties, just as in classical mechanics. And yet, even with the availability of that option, Bohmian is probably, the Bohmian interpretation is probably the least uh, accepted interpretation of quantum mechanics. Absolutely. It's not even taught as one of the alternatives. Maybe it is mentioned in one sentence somewhere in a undergraduate physics course where... Griffiths doesn't. Griffiths doesn't talk about it at all. I think he mentions it just... Oh, he does? Yeah, because he mentions... uh, So Griffiths is one of these uh, commonly used textbooks for an introductory quantum mechanics book. And I think he mentions uh, hidden variable theories as a Uh, catch-all phrase. And Bohmian mechanics is one of these hidden variable theories. And the reason why... Well, it's still a mystery to a lot of us, why Bohmian mechanics remained so neglected as a theory. It was a mystery to John Bell, who was a great proponent of this theory. And uh, many people have looked into this question. Some of the reasons proposed are, for example, that von Neumann, who was a leading mathematician and present at this foundational moment, produced a theorem which said that any hidden variable theory is incorrect. Yeah, any hidden variable theory would be incorrect. But then... And it was uh, within three years of him publishing that result, people showed that uh, his result was... There was a hidden assumption in his result. But because of uh, the reputation that von Neumann had, those papers didn't get the publicity. And when Bohmian mechanics came about, people didn't pay attention because they didn't they they expected it to have some hidden flow in it. So it was only much later after Bell championed this theory that people took some interest in it and realized that this is just as valid an interpretation of quantum mechanics as the other interpretations. Clearly not enough interest, right? Even today, there's very... I mean, people like Sean Carroll very happily go into the many worlds interpretation, which we I think we talked about a little bit before which is a much more extreme (laughs) interpretation when it comes to accepting what is real and what is not. Yeah, so just a word on the many worlds interpretation. So let's go back to the Schrodinger's cat paradox that we set up earlier. So before you open that box, you have the possibility that the cat is in a superposition of being dead and alive. When you open the box, there is a probability 50% that the cat is alive and 50% that the cat is dead. Now, everybody agrees on this, but the question is, why in a particular instance do you find the cat to be alive or dead? This question is answered by the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics by saying that, in fact, when you open the box, the universe splits. And in one universe, the cat is alive. And in the other universe, the cat is dead. So, in fact, there's no choice to be made at all. The question doesn't arise. Both possibilities take place. They're just in alternate universes. And this is taken to be, this is, believe it or not, it might seem like science fiction 
of an extreme kind, but this is a very popular understanding amongst interpretation amongst leading physicists today. That every moment there's an infinite number of universes being generated at every decision point branching right. out. And let's go back to what is forcing this interpretation onto, well, nothing is forcing this, but why they're making this choice is simply because they've taken quantum mechanics to be ultimate truth. And so, when they're faced with the question why they observe one reality versus another, because they cannot find another alternate answer, they have reinterpreted uh, the equation to mean that the universe splits at every instant. And there is no way to measure these alternate universes because, well, by definition, these universes are splitting off each other and uh, one universe cannot communicate with the other universe. So there is no experimental verification of this prediction. But because it does not require further investigation, it's like, a, you know, it's the end of an argument. That's it. Yeah, like, you know, as a person who is not that well versed with uh, quantum mechanics, for me, this sounds really absurd. Mm -hmm. Rick and Morty. This yeah, is Rick, Rick and Morty, man, seriously. Right, so we kind of ran out of steam on that absurd note. But just I just want to mention before I close off that uh, I, we don't have anything against Rick and Morty. We actually love that show. It's one of our favorite cartoon shows. So nothing against Rick and Morty, but please don't turn physics into a cartoon. That's really all we're trying to ask for. So we hope you found this first series of episodes useful, and we're hoping to make more of them. Let's see what happens.